Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 16 where we'll attempt to the answer the question, what are cnidarians and what has their fossil record revealed about the history of life? Cnidarians are the simplest of all true metazoans. They are slightly more complex than sponges because they have specialized cell tissues arranged into two layers. Hence, cnidarians are what we term diploblastic, which means having two layers of cells. The outer layer is called the ectoderm, and the inner layer is called the endoderm. There's no cavity between these layers of cells, but you can find some specialized cells called mesogalia, a simple network of nerve cells that allow for basic communication between the two nerve cells. The body is arranged to have a simple opening which serves as both the mouth and the anus. That must make for some really gross dinner parties. The outer ectoderm cells serve various roles. Most are muscle epithelial cells, which serve as both the outer skin of the animal as well as the muscle cells, which can contract when activated by the mesogala. The other ectoderm cells are specialized nemosis. These are the stinging cells with poisonous fluids used for protection and food capture. The nemo cells contain a hair trigger, nidocil, which releases a thread attached to a poisonous sac, which can harpoon prey and drag them into the mouth anus cavity. The inner endoderm layers serve the role of digestion and are expanded into radial partitions to maximize the surface area. One of the most fascinating aspects of cnidarians are their complex lifestyle, which is termed polymorphism. In the basic life cycle of a cnidarian, the sessile polyp gives rise to free-floating medusa through asexual reproduction. The medusa reproduces with other medusa sexually to produce a zygote, which then produces a larvae that then becomes a sessile polyp. Polyps feed by facing upward, whereas medusa feed by facing downward. A typical jellyfish is the medusa stage, while cor corals are the polyp stage of the life cycle. Some groups forego either the medusa stage or become completely sessile, or the polyp stage and become completely mobile, while others retain the polymorphism and have both types of, um, of forms. The phylum Cnidaria is split into three classes. The hydrozoan, known from the Precambrian to recent, retain both life stages, both the polyp and medusa stage. The scaphozoa, also known from the Precambrian to re recent, retain only the medusa stage and include many jellyfish. The anthrozoa, also known from the Precambrian to recent, retain only the polyp stage and includes corals and sea anemones, gorgions, and sea pins. Okay, let's take a look at the first group, the hydrozoans. The two best known modern members of the hydrozoa are the small freshwater pond hydra, belonging to the order Hydriida, and the fire coral, Millipoda belonging to the order Hydrochloriana. The Hydrochloria um, form skeletons out of chitin and, as such, really lack a extensive fossil record, although there are several symbiotic forms that are known to live within calcareous tube worms. However, the Hydrochloriania, the fire corals, form calcareous skeletons and can be an important reef builder. The modern fire, fire coral, Millipoda, has three types of zooids, the zooids are individual multicellular animals that live within a colony. The first type are the gastrozooids that feed, which are surrounded by the didactyl zooids, which have extensive nemosis, a poisonous stingers that are used to capture prey, and the ampulla, which produce the free-floating medusa, which are released in the water and reproduce sexually by releasing either eggs or sperm, to produce small larvae that form new fire colonies. These are where Millipoa get, actually gets its names, which means millions of spores, in reference to all of those uh, medusas that are released by the, by, by, by the polyps. Zooids can also form by asexually budding, which um, allow for the colonies to grow over time and to branch. 
Another well-known member of the Hydrozoa is the Portuguese Man of War, which is a colony of zooids that are planktonic and highly poisonous with numerous nemesis. The class Scilfozoa includes the jellyfish and retain just the medusa stage of the life cycle. Jellyfish rarely fossilize since they lack any hard skeleton and only are preserved as body impressions. One unique group of Scaphozoa are the conulets or the conularids, which are these really strange pyramid shaped fossils that are composed of a ridges of phosphatic skeletons. They kind of look like upside down ice cream cones. And these fossils appear to be scaphozoids due to the presence of tentacles and the fact that they are planktonic and being found in deep marine facies by floating around in the ocean. The class Anthrozoa includes cnidarians with only the polyp stage of the life cycle and lack any medusoid stage. They include corals, sea anemones, gorgians, and sea pins. The polyps can produce both eggs and sperm which fertilize into new generations of polyps. Anthrozoan polyps are much larger in size compared to the smaller polyps of hydrozoans. There are three subclasses of anthrozoans, the Suranthria, the Octocorea, and the Zooanthria. The Suranthria lack hard skeletons and such are not known from the fossil record. The Octocorea are corals that have polyps that have an eight-fold symmetry. They are su supported by a gelatinous coating, with some forming a skeleton with calcareous spicules. A few secrete enough calcareous spicules to be recognized in the fossil record, but they're fairly rare. The most common fossil corals are members of the zooanthria, which are often called the stony corals because their colonies form hard skeletons in the major reefs of the ocean. They're also called true corals. Their skeletons are made of aragonite in which the soft polyp sits upon. And these cups are called corallium, which house a number of septa that are arranged radially in multi multiples of six in modern corals. There are eight orders of Zoonathria, but only three that we'll cover in depth in this class. The Rugosa and Tabulata are both extinct groups with fantastic fossil record in the Paleozoic. Both groups become extinct at the end of the Permian. The Sclerotinian appear in the Triassic and are known today, representing the more common corals found in modern coral reefs. Each of these groups are distinct and easily recognized from fossils. The Rugosa are horned-shaped corals. They exhibit a bilateral symmetry around a series of septa that expand out of a horned-shaped skeleton that supported a single polyp. The cup shape, or callus, held the basal ectoderm layer of the polyp. The outer part of the horn is covered in epithecia, or calca uh, calcareous skin, while the internal septa provide a method for identification and classification of various groups of rugosa. Rugosa are known from the middle Ordovician to late Permian, and unlike many other corals, do not form real proper reefs. They were mostly solitary, although colonies are known in the fossil record in which various polyps would grow in close association. Rugosa corals expanded through asexual reproduction through budding and increasing the skeleton as the individual polyps matured. These buds would form within the calyx by axial split or by budding along the periphery of the calyx or by lateral increase fully independent of the parent callus. Rugosa also show a pattern of rejuvenescence, where the polyp would grow through periods of starvation and regrowth that likely reflect changing environments and the ability for the corals to become more dormant during harsh times and enjoy growth during better times. The Rugosa corals show that they tr can trend to grow upward to attain an advantageous position in the water column. The next well-represented fossil group of corals is called the tabulata, which are known from the Cambrian to late Permian and exhibit horizontal tabula. And unlike the rugosa, are colonial and they actually lack um, septa. They grow through asexual budding, forming broad colonies of polyps within a skeletal structure called a corallium. 
they can bud on the periphery or emerge between these correlates, separating uh, across out over the ocean floor. Both the Rugosa and Tabulata were diverse during the Paleozoic, and both became extinct at the end of the Permian-Triassic boundary, attesting to the really massive extinction that wiped out all the corals living at that time. Another aspect of studying fossil corals is that they can be used as geochronometers. The annual and monthly rings on the Rugosa horn corals can be used to calculate the length of a year in the distant past. For example, based on Rugosa corals 400 million years ago in the Devonian, the year was actually about 400 days long, so with much shorter days, the Earth was spinning faster. Eventually, in the far future, the Earth's rotation will continue to slow down, and eventually it will match the orbit of the moon, and hence a year will last 24 days. But don't worry, this will not happen for many mi billions of years. The inertia of the Earth's orbit will continue to rotate the planet, with only the sun and moon slowing it down slowly. After the Permian-Triassic boundary, modern corals appear in the mid-Triassic, the sclerotinian corals. Sclerotinian corals secrete a aragonitic skeleton with septa in multiples of six. After the first protoseptic grow, they expand to 12, then 24. This star-like pattern of septa quickly distinguishes them from rugosa, which are bilateral in their septa formation. Sclerotinian corals are colonial, and hence they resemble the tabulata corals in encrusting the ocean floor. Sclerotinian corals grow through asexual budding of the polyps, but also sexual reproduction by excreting sperm and egg and eggs into the water. Sclerotinians likely arose from some sort of soft sea anemone, but began secreting a hard skeleton and hence became very common in the fossil record. There are two types of sclerotinian corals, the zoonanthia and the non-zoonanthia. The zoonanthia um, contain symbiotic algae, a type of dinoflagellate, which are grown on the coral by photosynthesis and then are actually consumed or eaten by the polyps. This food that's provided by the symbiotic algae constitute about 95% of the food of, for the pol polyps. The algae also produces oxygen, which helps the polyps grow. The zoanthia corals can only grow in the photic zone and they're rarely found below depths of around 90 meters. Most of them are actually pretty shallow waters, around 50 meters. The non-zoanthian corals can grow at much deeper depths, and those are the ones that lack the symbiotic algae. Zoanthian sclerotinian corals are one of the major reef-building organisms on the planet. Today, they can form atolls and reefs, which are home to an incredible diversity of life. These reefs are resistant to waves and provide for shallow lagoons, which offer a protective habitat for many uh, marine organisms. These reefs can become incredibly thick deposits of carbonate, as thick as two kilometers. Study of living corals also give us insight into the habits along the margins of the coast. And by studying the types of corals along the shoreline, we can reconstruct the changes to the depositional environment. Where corals are subjected to uh, dropping sea levels and they're exposed to the air, they can die and actually erode, while corals within the photic zone flourish as long as they remain in the water. Such patterns can be important for the exploration of petroleum reservoirs associated with ancient coral reef complexes, such as those in the Permian Basin of Texas and Saudi Arabia. This diagram shows the geological ranges of the various fossil coral groups, with modern sclerotinians out here appearing in the mid-Triassic and as the sole large group of corals that have skeletons uh, living today. And this, really, this graph here really demonstrates what a profound effect the Permian-Triassic boundary had in terms of the different types of corals that are recorded in the fossil record. Today, modern corals are threatened by pollution and acidification, 
uh, which both lead to coral bleaching where the symbiotic algae, the diaphylagellates, actually die and the polyps of the coral starve. Acidification is increasing um, due to the large amount of carbon dioxide being dissolved from within the ocean water as the atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide increase. And this makes it more difficult for sclerotinian corals to construct their skeletons and this disrupts the zoanthia living within the coral. In the future, we may see another major extinction of corals resulting in a mass extinction that maybe resembles the Permian-Triassic extinction event in its extent. Thank you for watching uh, this quick little lecture on fossil corals. If you're interested in taking a geology course with Utah State University, check out the department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in my research and who I am, check out my website at benjamin